So uh, uh, welcome everyone. So my name is Daniel Howard. I am a HPC consultant within the consulting services group at uh, NCAR. Uh, so today we'll be presenting on directive-based programming with OpenACC. Uh, we'll be using uh, MiniWeather, uh, which is a mini app developed at Oak Ridge National Lab by Matt Norman as a, a test model for us to work with today. Um, but to cover OpenACC, we'll be uh, going over various details. Uh, first, comparing OpenACC with OpenMP and ISO standard, standard language parallelism. And just giving you an overview of those uh, approaches. Um, from there, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the fork joint execution model uh, for attached GPU accelerators. And then we'll actually go into the OpenACC API directives uh, using unified memory. And we'll talk about kernels, parallel, and uh, serial uh, kernel constructs within the uh, OpenACC language. Um, so again, work workshop etiquette, make sure to mute yourself during the session. Question maybe send it in the chat or in Slack. Uh, feel free to raise your hand and unmute. Uh, and if I have time, I'll, I'll ask you to, to ask your question away. Otherwise, we might spend time at the end of the session or uh, outside of the session in Slack to, to address any any uh, questions you might have. Uh, by joining today, you are uh, you are agreeing to UCAR's code of conduct, and the meeting today will be re recorded and other materials will be archived and shared pu publicly. Um, if you have any issues uh, beyond this workshop session, feel free to reach out to us or uh, either through Slack or to the support.ucar.edu page. Um, so uh, again, uh, if you'd like to participate uh, interactively with the session, feel free to start up a session like you normally would with uh, in engaging with our uh, compute cluster by going to the uh, Jupyter Hub. Uh, you should start up a compute, compute server on the Casper batch nodes for about 90 minutes, just giving you some extra time at the end if you'd like to complete any uh, any work or, or follow through on, uh, on items. Uh, you're also welcome to just like restart a session in your own time uh, uh, whenever you may want to revisit this particular project or, or past sessions. Um, so make sure you set the project code to UCIS004 in the uh, JupyterHub login. That's that's how you are permitted to, to uh, engage with the cluster. Um, for today, during the workshop, we'll be actually using the GPU workshop queue. So make sure you change that uh, there and then specify the GPU type to GP100. This just helps make sure that we have access to, to a appropriate number of resources during the workshop um, as we have reserved for us. Otherwise, uh, the, the V100s are typically in high demand and might be difficult for the large group of us to have uh, access to. Um, if you have any questions about the, the queue structure or anything, feel free to reference the queue documentation here. Um, uh, as you have time, feel free to like just go over some of these uh, useful definitions I'll be uh, mentioning throughout the rest of the session, but uh, feel free to uh, refer back to them at your own time. Um, so let, let's first talk about portability and uh, comparing OpenACC, OpenMP, and ISO standard language parallelism. So uh, recall from earlier sessions that we talked a lot about prescriptive versus descriptive programming. Um, in general, uh, the descriptive paradigms, they give you the flexibility to the uh, uh, compiler to be able to achieve um, how the program is, is, is then effectively run on the GPU. Uh, whereas for a prescriptive approach, the, uh, uh, basically you as the uh, programmer have, have to have, the onus control is then upon you to uh, tell the compiler how exactly it will be uh, placed on the G GPU and run uh, parallel. So it, OpenMP, for example, started around 1997, was predominantly a pre prescriptive, is predominantly pre prescriptive approach, but OpenACC is more descriptive, and that, but that was started more, uh, later on in about 2011 as GPUs became more popular. Um, more recently, we've had some advancements in ISO standard language parallelism, or stood par, as some people like to call it. Uh, that's, that also tends more descriptive, but nonetheless, uh, given it's, it's uh, only recent development, it's still early stage in terms of implementation across compilers. Um, more compilers overall support OpenMP and fewer support OpenACC. Uh, each of those links, you know, if you click on them, will show you uh, which compilers uh, are, are supporting each uh, language API. Uh, nonetheless, uh, OpenMP uh, uh, only recently added GPU offload support, so the, the it's not necessarily robust yet in terms of cross all compilers for, for GPU offload. Uh, nonetheless. Uh, um, OpenACC, as it was initially developed, was specifically targeted for GPUs. So it, it is the, uh, what at least I consider the more mature uh, 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 option for, for enabling uh, programming GPU in an in a easy manner without necessarily having to go down to the weeds with CUDA. Um, if, if you are interested in OpenMP uh, offload, uh, you, 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 should, you can check out the uh, various resources. One I recommend is Oak Ridge National Lab's uh, introduction to OpenMP GPU offload. 
But nonetheless, it's important to note that legacy OpenMP code will not run well off the shelf on GPUs. There are, there are specific directives that will have to be edited and changed in order to target the GPU device effectively. And if you want to learn more how to do that effectively, feel free to, again, reference that previous presentation. Um, as the as standard language parallelism uh, uh, kicks off more, that is aiming to replace the need for directives entirely. But nonetheless, the, the capability is not quite there yet, so I can't quite promise uh, uh, using it quite yet. But uh, th there is already support to it, so you're welcome to explore that uh, already. I'm happy to point you to additional resources if you like. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, if you want to read more about these kind of comparison and topic there, feel free to read the blog post by Michael Wolf of burying the open HCC and versus open MP hatchet. So um, and it, I kind of bring this up just in the sense of wanting to encourage you to think about the, the long-term needs of your software projects you might be approaching or starting with any of your, your upcoming research. Um, all of these approaches, I think they, they will work perfectly well for any, for any uh, uh, current need, but it's important to consider any long-term portability needs of your code. So if you plan to work across multiple systems, it, it, it might be prudent to think about what, what other systems support and what, uh, uh, what would end up working well and with least amount of work to, to uh, port code between the different systems. Um, luckily enough, the, many of these descriptive approaches uh, using uh, directives between OpenACC, OpenMP, as well as StudPAR, they're relatively portable, but there are some quirks to, to sometimes get them to work uh, optimally on different types of devices, say beyond NVIDIA GPUs. Um, th there are some philosophical differences we could talk more about, but I might, I might just let you review that in your own time so you can spend more time on the interactive content later on in the session. So uh, just to reiterate, you know, the in terms of if you are have still, still some, some some concerns in terms of choices between OpenACC, OpenMP, they are in fact relatives. OpenACC did branch off of OpenMP development around uh, 2011 when it started, um, and over time, you know, the, Nvidia has primarily supported OpenACC, and Intel has now uh, taken a, a greater interest in OpenMP. But nonetheless, you know, th they are related to each other. And that, so there, there's a significant, um, uh, uh, just, just train, similar trains of thought between each languages in terms of how they're implemented. That makes it easy to, to go between the two if say you wanted to, to, to refactor one approach to the other and say you, you're just wanting, you think the other one might be faster. It, it wouldn't be too much of a, of a uh, headache to go jump between the two. Nonetheless, I think choosing one should be fine and they, are, they do tend to be nowadays pretty portable in terms of like OpenACC can target both uh, um, NVIDIA GPUs as well as with HPE compilers can, can target AMD G, uh, GPUs, well as, well as OpenMP with uh, various uh, compiler suites as well can uh, target not just uh, Intel CPUs, can al also start targeting you know, uh, 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 Intel GPUs as well as then uh, uh, NVIDIA GPUs, of course. Um, and the same thing even for NVIDIA compilers now that does have the uh, stood, uh, uh, the flag that std equals mp and that's for and that basically allows um nvidia compilers to recognize open mp code and that can also then target offload to to nvidia gpus um so th there's lots of these combinations that work whether or not they eventually as john urbanic here in his slide that, that I, I graciously uh, uh use from his open mp and gpus talk um that there may be a time when the, these standards might merge back into OpenMP. There may also be a time where, where stood par and standard language parallelism would replace all of them and we get, get, go away from uh, 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 these directive-based approaches. But nonetheless, it's uh, um, that's an open question, and it's really there's just strong opinions in the community on which one might be best. So I think ultimately choosing one, at least for for Casper and Derecho being an NVIDIA system, we, we think OpenACC would be an appropriate choice for, for any of your implementations today on, on, our, on our clusters. Um, so again, just reiterating the fact that the relatives, OpenACC and OpenMP, you know, th th these are the types of directives that you, you would and we'll be writing later on today um, that uh, uh, dictate how the uh, program is an offload on the GPU. And they basically have similar equivalents between OpenMP and OpenACC that could basically be dropped and replaced in most cases. Um, there's there's some edits that that still be worked out in terms of how that transition process works, but nonetheless, uh, it, just reiterating that it's it's not a difficult process to, to change between between the two, if if there's that need at some point in the future, but uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, let's just talk about like how these kind of programming models work in the first place. So for for both OpenMP and OpenACC, they they employ uh, similar execution models, which, which is known as the fork join execution model. So in, it's essentially um, you, you would have uh, initially serial code you might be running on like the CPU or the host device, 
And then you encounter a parallel section of the code where then the host process forks off many threads process that parallel code. Um, OpenMP allows some degree of nested parallelism and like fine grained control of like different segments of thread or sections of threads within that uh, forking process. Whereas GPU programming kind of expect, expects really that all these threads are performing the exact same processes at the same time. So there's less flexibility in terms of the, the uh, varying amount of control across threads in, in GPU programming using OpenACC, whereas OpenMP, if it's targeting OpenACC, Open, uh, OpenMP when it's targeting CPUs, uh, it tends to have a, a bit more flexibility in terms of uh, what you're able to do. Um, nonetheless, as I discussed last week uh, or, or a couple sessions back, the uh, uh, degree of parallelism achievable by GPU is just much greater uh, given the number of uh, threads that, that could be processed by the many more uh, streaming multiprocessors compared to the uh, only order scale of like 100 uh, uh, CPU cores available on like the, the best uh, uh, server class uh, CPUs we have today. Um, so the, the, just be, be, because we have that much larger number of threads that we have to manage with uh, GPUs, they have to simplify that towards like every single thread is essentially doing the same thing. So that, that's, that's kind of how the process works in terms of comparing, say, the, uh, uh, an OpenMP kind of CPU kind of based uh, uh, threading and fork join model versus the uh, OpenACC model, which really has all threads doing the exact same thing. So you might have heard the concept of like a master thread and like a master thread that really doesn't exist in GPU uh, programming, uh, for example. Um, so when we actually like end up writing the code and you know putting in these uh, directives for uh, uh, converting a code to to, a, to a, a parallel runtime that can run on the GPU, all it takes is adding in these special com comments and they're basically called directives. They essentially uh, serve as hints to the compiler to tell it which sections of the code are in fact parallelizable, and thus then the compiler would do additional analysis and and devise a way to to push that code onto the uh, uh, GPU appropriately. Uh, essentially, you know, both OpenMP and, Op and, and OpenACC uh, use these similar approaches for how to do that. And if you have experience with one, uh, it, OpenACC is not that different uh, uh, when you're uh, from, from this perspective. So um, invariably, we'll be focusing on OpenACC just given its maturity, as I've mentioned earlier, as well as just, you know, we have only limited time for, for, for one programming model in a single session. So uh, today we'll be focusing on MiniWeather. Uh, this is an, a mini app for simulating weather-like flows. Uh, again, it's developed by Matt Noem primarily at Oak Ridge. Um, so for example, this is one of the types of test cases you, could, you can run, which is a uh, injection jet stream in a stable atmosphere. There are, there are five test cases that you can play around with if you look into the code and I encourage you to either go directly to the mini weather repo itself or, or uh, investigate, uh, investigate the code and documentation that's, that's available within the, this uh, repo here. Um, that's part from the mini weather uh, uh, code base. So um, we're, we're, let's start with this, the interactive kind of section of the of the uh, of the uh, workshop today. So uh, let's just test first that mini weather builds correctly. Uh, we'll be using this um, CMake Casper uh, uh, script file that that's using NVHPC as a compiler. Um, that that is located in the Fortran build directory here, uh, here. One of these files is that. There's many others for other systems. If you want to jump around to a different system you have access to, um, that happens to already have a file in place for you. Um, for example, Summit, you can run this on and, and uh, uh, do similar analysis that we will be doing, doing today. Um, to, to note, we will focus on the Fortran OpenACC versions, but there are many other versions and there's many weather app that allow you to compare and contrast between the OpenMP, stood par, uh, C++ implementations of the same. So feel free to explore whatever interests you the most in terms of uh, see, seeing how the model performs with different implementations. Um, if you want to look, learn more specifically about MiniWeather's compiling process, feel free to follow its documentation. But nonetheless, you know, we have this cell block here. We can run it, uh, just use shift enter there. And we see that it's basically, uh, what it's doing is building a, uh, using CMake to build our make system and files that uh, basically uh, target the G GPU and, uh, and have the compiler appropriately read the source files to, to convert that code to GPU code. So you can see some of these flags here. This is like the ACC and GPU CC60, CC70. CC60 is for the GP100, CC70 is for the V100s. And if eventually if you get access to an A100, you, you would maybe target the A100 with CC80. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it's building all these make files for us. And so we're building the an MPI version, an MPI test version uh, for a smaller scale model, and then an OpenACC version that's already been implemented and has all the directives already in place for you, and then OpenACC test version of that, of that the same. 
So uh, let's validate that that all built, built correctly. Uh, we'll be using this check output script here that you can uh, open and, and uh, see what exactly it's doing to do that. Um, basically, we're, we're going to uh, submit to our queue here, and hopefully there's uh, uh, GPUs available um, in terms of uh, uh, what we're trying to do. And I guess in, in this case, I still had it set to use the V100s because when I went back up, uh, the uh, I did not re-enter re the cell up there. But nonetheless, the GPU dev queue does happen to usually be pretty free during the day. Uh, uh, so uh, you're welcome to use that as well if you like. But as you can see, so the, this MPI test uh, did run effectively. Um, so, and we can see, you know, it, it, this is the change in mass with the code. So the mass was conserved and total energy was also conserved. There's, there's a, you know, some minor error there just in terms of, uh, 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 you know, uh, machine precision available. Um, but nonetheless, uh, th these are within bounds that we expect with, for this particular uh, uh, code. Um, and uh, we can then also do the same for the OpenACC test version of it. Um, so when we run this cell, basically it's now running the GPU version of it. We see it for the MPI version, it ran in about 0.9 seconds. But now for this uh, the OpenACC version, it ran in about 0.16 seconds. So uh, that's, that, that is a significant improvement. And yet again, this is also a much smaller model. Uh, you know, once we scale this up to like a much larger domain size that would actually effectively use the full capability of a GPU, uh, the speed up might be significantly larger. Um, so uh, let, let me know if you, I'll, I'll pause for a minute here, just make sure everyone is, has been able to, to run these, these two few cells we've gone through. Um, feel free to uh, submit any issues in the chat and um, uh, either I, I can address them directly or hopefully one of my colleagues will. Um, uh, but uh, uh, not seeing anything in the chat, I'll, I'll go ahead and keep on moving forward. So um, well, let's first talk about the OpenACC and kernels parallels directive. Um, so th this will be used under the unified managed memory approach with uh, GPU computing. Uh, so uh, uh, basically we, we have, if, if you'd like to learn more about specifically in the, the whole scope of OpenACC computing, there is a quick reference guide uh, here uh, that you can uh, look, read, uh, look into and reference um, that, that has a uh, larger scale description of all, of all the specific nitty gritty details, but I will focus on just a few that's important here. Um, otherwise, if you want to go into even a, a larger, more full specification standard, you can read this document or, or even a, a kind of more explanatory kind of learning document uh, with the uh, best practices guide. And uh, thanks, Brian, for helping Lily in the chat. Uh, feel free to uh, reach out there uh, further for any, any other support. Um, so I'll, I'll keep uh, charging on ahead and hopefully we'll, we'll have that sorted before we uh, um, get to the next section. So first, like in introducing the kernels in parallel approach, uh, we're, we're going to first avoid having to manage memory. So there, there is a, a, a process in terms of managing memory manually that helps to optimize that for, uh, during um, the, the runtime environment. But uh, you can basically also just like pass a flag to the compiler uh, which is in this case would be GPU managed. And that basically tells the compiler to, to build up a, an abstraction of unified memory across the CPU and GPU devices. So before you would have a separate memory space for the CPU and a separate memory space for the GPU. And you'd have to go back and forth always like telling the, telling the program when to move CPU memory from the CPU to the GPU and back and forth whenever, whenever you encounter a parallel kernel and then have to process something parallel then process something serially. But in the unified approach, basically, whenever it encounters something that's not there yet, um, it will basically encounter page fault and then will pull the memory from the other side uh, automatically without you nece not necessarily having to, to navigate that yourself. It just makes the, the development step uh, uh, process much easier to like the initial process where you can you know, make some significant progress uh, parallelizing your code without uh, uh, too much effort but, uh, right off the bat. So um, I see one question in the chat. Let's, uh, let's see, does the joint directive CC60, CC70 produce two executables for both classes of GPU? Uh, in this case, no, it basically just produces a, one larger executable that has uh, 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 you know, instruction sets for both classes of, of GPUs uh, in that same executable. It'd be a slightly larger file, but uh, it'll be able to target both of them at the same time. Um, and so if you happen to have a machine that's heterogeneous and has multiple types of GPUs, like in our case, where we have GPU, GP100s on some nodes and V100s on other nodes, and we even have some uh, for, for friendly users, uh, A100s, uh, you, you, could, um, you can specify those additional flags and the, the, that execute will be portable across those different devices. So uh, um, 
nonetheless, uh, uh, th that's, you know, that's answering that question. And then if anyone has any questions on unified memory approach, there's that, but we'll, we'll discuss more in terms of manually man managing memory in the next session. But for now, some, some routines already in our exercise file will, will have um, uh, some data directives just in place, just, just to make the, the complications about using MPI within it uh, a, lot, it's a little bit easier for you. Um, so uh, uh, using the descriptive ACC kernels, um, we're, we're going to start with that first. So basically, um, the kernels directive is, is, a, is a more of a descriptive approach for how we can uh, suggest to the, compil to the compiler to run a, a GPU program. So basically, uh, as before, when I showed you th that kind of way in which we decorate, decorate for loops, um, when we add these ACC kernels, the, the, the uh, or directives, um, the compiler will then analyze the, the computational code within those, uh, those loops and decide if that loop is paralyzable, and then also decide uh, uh, how to paralyze that in a, in a uh, mostly optimal fashion. And it's, it's getting better as the compilers uh, uh, release new versions each year in terms of uh, um, the ability to, to perform uh, uh, effective analysis and produce uh, effective code. But nonetheless, the, in, in the, when you're using ACC kernels, the compiler does the heavy lifting for you. There's, there's minimal work on the programmer side to, to, to basically run the GPU code. Nonetheless, um, it is difficult to achieve, achieve the most optimal performance with just the kernel directives alone. So um, after, after you finish this, this, this section, we'll talk a little bit more about how to uh, greater direct the compiler to, for, with a more prescriptive approach about how to increase the performance uh, uh, with the specific uh, clauses that define uh, um, uh, the, the type of parallelism you want to achieve. So it's, it's just important to note, you know, just to, uh, from the ACC kernels approach, you know, in, in Fortran, um, you, you, you just have to use the, use, uh, the ACC kernels uh, uh, comment right at the uh, outside of the top of the for loop you, and, or nested for loops you want to target. And then you have to end that for loop with the ACC end kernels uh, to encapsulate uh, either the, a singular for loop or, uh, as I said, a tightly nested group of, of, of uh, new for loops. So uh, it's important to note that these regions within those for loops must not have any data dependencies between, between loop iterations. Um, if, if it would, that would cause a database condition. And uh, ideally, usually the, the ACC kernel uh, uh, compiler analysis, uh, auto parallelization analysis, will see that and then tell you that it can't parallelize that section of code. Um, and so you might have to do a redesign of that loop uh, uh, if you want to actually get that to run on the GPU, because it, it, you really require um, the, 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 there not to be any data contention across loop iterations. Otherwise, you're going to get incorrect results. Um, luckily, the kernel's directive will, will help you avoid that and just won't let you run the code on a GPU if, if it sees that condition. But uh, you, you just have you basically be having a serial loop in that case. And, um, you, you it would be good for you to, to, to look through an alternative way to speed up that, that uh, section of the code. Um, at the end of any of these kernels that, that uh, we create uh, using ACC kernels or any other sort of compute construct in OpenACC, uh, there's always an implicit barrier at the end of those parallel execution regions. Basically, that means is the ho host that will pause execution until that kernel, kernel completes. So uh, 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 basically, you know, since we had the CPU device and GPU device as separate compute units or, or processing units, uh, they they can they can work asynchronously with each other. Um, and you and but with the OpenACC approach, uh, by default, you, it, it expects to wait between each uh, uh, you know program executable submitted to each uh, uh, device. If you if you want to navigate. Uh, uh, what performing operations on those devices asynchronously. There are clauses to do that uh, using the async and wait clauses. But we'll talk about more uh, of that uh, in a, 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 a later sessions. Um, additionally, uh, and we'll talk about this more with the more prescriptive approaches later on, you can specify a number of gangs, workers, vector lengths, and we'll talk a little bit more, more about that later. Uh, only one compute construct may be within scope at a time. So kernels parallel and serial cannot be uh, nested within each other. They're going to be one. Uh, type within each each section. So uh, uh, here's an example of how you can surround a particular um, accelerated section of code. Uh, so basically, you know, you have ACC kernels. You can just leave it as that. Or if you want to, to start specifying some uh, 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 types of, of parallelization you want the compiler to to do, um, that, that that you can add these clauses there as well um, to to exercise that. So here we have our first kind of exercises where you can engage with the model yourself. So what, what I want you to do is you just click this link here that'll open the uh, MiniWeather uh, MPI exercise file. 
you can see the source file, it's about 800 lines long. So it's not too big of a deal, but I understand it can be a little bit uh, cumbersome to get around. Nonetheless, uh, you can just you know, do Command F or Control F and you can look for the to-dos. And that, that's basically where we want you to be entering in these uh, um, ACC kernels directives. And that will basically uh, uh, tell the compiler in these sections of code that, uh, you know, luckily for, for you, we've already kind of done the analysis that they are parallelizable to an extent. Uh, we'll let, let you do some additional work to, to figure out later how to optimize that performance. But nonetheless, uh, th these are some, you know, typical kind of like CFD type calculations run in, uh, in this mini weather application that would be parallelizable. So um, essentially, you know, we have, uh, th there's about seven sections for you to do. Four of them uh, are, are missing those directives. Three of them already have them. Uh, feel free to, to go through those sections and add them. And I'll start going through them the same just to, just to show you, but uh, uh, nonetheless, I'll just explain some things first. Uh, uh, basically, again, we have the GPU manage flag within the, our, our, our make file set, as well as this mInfo Excel flag. So after you add any of these directives, uh, basically you, you can run this cell and then it will, uh, it, it essentially it's, it's, it's already built out uh, um, some accelerations, as I said, in these, these last three lines. And so this is gonna make it an exercise file. So it's different from the previous files we, uh, executables we made. Um, so th with this mminfill Excel flag, we actually see later on, you know, in this section of code here, starting here, when it's building the uh, uh, OpenACC test example uh, here, uh, it's, it's now showing you what exactly it's doing in terms of, uh, of generating um, uh, NVIDIA GPU codes. You can see sections with saying and generating NVIDIA GPU code. It also, it's th this section of line is confirming given the kernel's directive that the analysis did in fact see that the loop is parallelizable. So then it goes forward and produces NVIDIA GPU code. And then th these two lines kind of tells, it, tells, it, uh, tells you how it chose to, uh, to parallelize that. There's also a section here in terms of the data movement parts, but because we have uh, GPU managed memory, you don't have to worry about that as much yet. Um, I mean, I see, uh, okay, Brian is just clarifying there. Um, so uh, back into these files here, let's go ahead and start adding um, these ACC kernels. So let's just put this here, ACC kernels there. And you remember you have to also end the kernel. Um, make sure you have the, as with any other program, you, you always have to be very pedantic in terms of uh, um, you know what terms you use. So you can't use kernel; it has to be kernels. Um, so uh, let's just make sure that's clarified there. Let's go to the next to do here. Uh, we can add ACC kernels there, and then we can also uh, uh, put that here, um, and then we can do the same for this uh, thread me here, and at, at the end of the end do sections. Um, let's see, let's do control at next to do just did that one. Some of them are right next to each other, so it makes it easy. So I think I already kind of got through all of them already in terms of the to do's, just double checking. Oh, no, there's one I missed. Um, I thought there was four, and only kind of three. So let's do that ACC and kernels. So make sure you push, uh, push command S or control S to save, depending on which OS you're in. Um, and so then after that's done, you can basically go back in here and uh, remake here. And I see already a comment from Will, like you mentioned the R end and exit kernels equivalent. Uh, they are in fact not. I kind of did that purposely uh, just to see, show you an error that might come up if you uh, type in any of this incorrectly. Um, so we, we see that the build failed. Uh, there's a syntax error at any ACC kernels and it gives a line number here. So it gives a line number back at 307. So you can go back to that, that area where he, uh, he noticed I, I put in the X as opposed to end. And we had just had to change that back to end. Um, but like that, that's just one way to troubleshoot and like uh, navigate any bugs you might encounter during, during the build process. Because it's possible you might put in a directive that just breaks something um, and it, it, will, it will just fail the build and you have to, you have to go and find it. But uh, it, there's usually a decent amount of, uh, um, uh, of, of error handling text that helps you navigate any of those sort of issues. Um, so long as you uh, uh, just you know look through the output from like the make process, but uh, so again here you know we, we can see what exactly the the uh, compiler is doing at each of these loops. You see some of them is parallelizable and they generate GPU code here for the two thirty one loop. Um, this is same here. Uh, one thing to note, um, as you said, we, we're using the kernel's directive. The kernel's directive is not very smart all the time in terms of uh, making optimal choices about how to parallelize each of these sections. So in, in this one. Uh, it, it is giving you some hints about like what it was not able to do. So it, it said, 
uh, there's some loop carry dependence ac across some of, some of the uh, loops. And thus then uh, it requires privatization here. It literally tells you what you need to do. Um, and we'll do that later on. But uh, uh, nonetheless, these end up running sequentially, not parallel. So you see this little sequen sequential keyword. Um, that's basically telling you that it, it's not running in, a, in an optimal way on the GPU. And it's in fact running in a way where you only have like one gang, one worker, and one thread. Basically, you're one thread at a time going through each of the loops. And it's, 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 it's very poor use of the resource on the GPU. So if you see something like that, that means some, you need to do something to try to fix that, or, or maybe even just keep it on the CPU, depending. Um, but uh, basically, all this, sort of, this information is useful to like look through to see how exactly the GPU is uh, porting the code and make the decision from there if, if some additional work needs to be done. So uh, anyway, so after we, we put in those codes, we can we can just test it, make sure it still works. It, it's still not optimal, but you know we can submit it and see how it performs. Um, uh, you, you should be able to use either the GPU workshop queue or the, uh, I'm still using GPU dev queue, but um, just not, there's not as many uh, uh, dev GPUs available. Uh, so encourage, if you're lucky on either one, you know, go ahead. But uh, nonetheless, um, I might end up just switching this back to the GPU. Oh, no, there it goes. OK. So uh, uh, yeah, one thing I will add for this one, uh, I previously did not enable this particular flag here in terms of some of our previous tests. But you can add this uh, environment variable during your, your execution of, a, uh, uh, of any GPU program, essentially, that's put on the GPU. And basically, it will, it will time each of the kernels and do some simple statistics for you. Um, it's not as comprehensive as the profilers, such as uh, uh, Nsight Systems and Nsight uh, Compute, which we'll cover at later sessions. But nonetheless, uh, this is a quick way to do to see some uh, uh, additional performance analysis on your codes. So if you like, you, you can go back to previous sections and change this from zero to one and see see the different types of performance and timings of things. But you, you, we can go through and see, you know, the, the certain certain uh, uh, sections of code and how they're ran effectively or not. Um, this one looks like a really long. Uh, runtime in terms of the, it was reached 1800 times. So that it, basically in the multiple loops that it's encountered, that kernel was launched 1800 times and it, it ends up taking about, uh, I believe these are measured in microseconds. So this is like seven, seven point so seconds of, of time just for that one kernel. And this is referencing that 281 kernel. So we can even go back, see which one that is. And I think that's one of them. Yeah, it's this, this one that's, that's running sequentially. So um, th th that's just telling us, you know, that one's having poor performance. And we're just confirming that with some of the output here in terms of the, the profiling results. Um, the, the results are a little long sometimes, a little bit cumbersome to, to navigate through, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it is very useful text if you know how to read it. Um, nonetheless, the overall time of that program was still 16 seconds. And so actually we did, did you know, kind of worse in terms of our, our serial, serial model. Um, and as I mentioned in like earlier sessions, it's, it's often the case when initially porting to GPU, you have to actually have slower performance. And so uh, uh, don't be afraid or, or, or put off by the fact that you might get slow performance initially. Um, it's, it's just part of the process of the development in terms of learning how to uh, port the code effectively to the GPU. Um, but nonetheless, you know, we do see it at least was like, uh, didn't introduce any bugs or errors. You know, we still are with bounds within, uh, 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 you know, around zero where we need to be in terms of change in mass and total energy. Um, and so that, that's, uh, uh, that's a good sign that like, at least there's no errors that we introduced. So uh, um, if you like, you, you can even just, you can build the, uh, uh, the full runtime program. That's like a, a larger scale problem. Um, if you like, you can uh, alter the code's configuration and uh, say, adjust uh, the size of the problem you're working on. And so you basically go to line 53 here. Um, you have the section here, we can set, specify the, the domain size, the simulation time, the output frequency of the images that, that are basically produced uh, of the data. That, that you can save to a file, to a NetCDF file, as well as the data spec, which is the, the type of uh, problem you're working on, be it a, 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 uh, um, a jet stream flow, or in this case, uh, let me double check which one, I think we're doing a, a, uh, uh, a gra uh, gravity wave, I think is the one we're working on currently. Um, but uh, nonetheless, um, the, uh, uh, if you, if, I'm not gonna run this one here, because it does take like about 40 seconds to get through, um, but, you, you can then run the full scale model and not the test version um, if you'd like. Uh, and as well as outside this workshop, you can then continue to play around with the model and uh, uh, work on it the same to, to see how the performance changes as, as well as also then see the actual results of the model itself um, using a, a, a NetCDF-like NetCDF file viewer. Um, but uh, any questions so far uh, before I move on?
I think I, I might want to double check which, which model we are using. And so I'm pretty sure, yeah, we're doing a, a data spec thermal is the, is the one we're using. Yep. Yeah, that, that's the, that's, this is the, 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 the thermal, thermal rise uh, uh, problem. And so uh, uh, again, you, you can see like the, the, if you go to the, the mini weathers like kind of repo here, which I opened briefly, um, basically, you know, this kind of gives some more details about altering those specs there. You can see the different types of, of data problems it has. And you can see the types of like outputs that it produces later on in terms of if you want to like toy around with the resolution and the fidelity of the vortices that, that each produces depending on, on the, the scale of the model. And given a GPU, you, you can actually uh, achieve high fidelity with many of these sort of results um, without necessarily incurring that much of a, a cost so far in terms of the runtime, just because the, the parallel capability of a GPU is so large that you, you can put such much larger problems on it without uh, uh, being worried about uh, um, you know, some like scaling uh, effects taking a place if you were instead on a CPU. Uh, so um, I encourage you to, to explore that further as you might be interested. So uh, we're, we're gonna move, move on towards the um, ACC parallel and ACC loop constructs. But before we do that, let's talk about uh, GPU execution task granularity. Um, we won't, this might be a more in-depth topic in terms of most people's needs. It's often useful just to have the compiler choose for you, like the, the configuration of, of gangs to vector to gangs to workers to vectors. But nonetheless, it's important to point out this kind of like uh, a way in which the GPU operates and schedules its uh, compute units across its device uh, and, and streaming multiplexers. So essentially, uh, in OpenACC, uh, and if, if you've worked with CUDA before or are familiar with it, the, the different names for these things, but they're, they're essentially uh, uh, very similar and have, have equivalencies. So um, basically, gangs uh, gangs are, are the thread blocks, if you're familiar with CUDA, that are composed of uh, basically workers and vectors, where work workers are, are, uh, are, are basically many threads that uh, are uh, uh, a collection of threads that basically are executing each of the vectors that is also a collection of threads. So whatever the number of workers and the number of vectors is the number of threads you're running in each block. And each block is basically a, a singular gain. Um, each gain gets placed on one streaming multiprocessor. So, so this is an example of the architecture layout um, of a streaming multiprocessor. We can see, so, sorry for the small size text, but you know, just wanted to make sure it, the idea is there, um, that there's different kind of like cores and sets of cores. Um, one, one important point to make, there's this L1 shared cast. If you zoom in here, uh, there's, uh, actually that's the instruction cast down here is a data cache. Uh, Basically, each of the gangs, they share the data cache across the whole uh, streaming multiprocessor. So uh, th there, there are certain specific directives that we'll talk about uh, later sessions about optimizing data locality within each gang um, that perhaps could improve in performance of, of, of uh, your program. But that, that, that does take more thought, just being aware in terms of how this arrangement works in terms of uh, uh, getting your, your, your code to run effectively on, on, on GPUs. So. Uh, um, it, it's just one way to think about it. And, you know, last point to make, you know, th th this is just one S streaming multiprocessor, but, but on, for example, the V100s, there's a, there's 104 streaming multiprocessors or wait, I think it's 94 for V100s and 104 for A100s. Nonetheless, the, the, the devices always change. The nice thing with, with OpenACC is that it can know which device you're running on and schedule appropriately given the device that it knows it's going to be sending the execution to. Um, but uh, for the gangs that get scheduled on the GPU, each gang gets assigned to one SM, and they they don't share uh, uh, see that that uh, that L1 cache between different uh, streaming multiprocessors. So um, if if there's a way in which to to localize data and how it's being accessed within a group of threads, such that uh, it does that effectively and in a coalesced manner, um, th that can help speed up the performance of that particular kernel, kernel effectively. So um, just having that awareness and. Uh, getting getting your head around that that kind of like framework of how GPU computing works can help you uh, work through ways in which to further optimize your, your, your code. But nonetheless, it's it's a in depth topic that might necessarily be necessary for for most people's usage because the compiler usually does a pretty good job in in choosing a good arrangement of these if if you uh, give it the right instructions. So, um, but uh, nonetheless, if you wanted to play around with it, there there are ways with OpenACC using the parallel and uh, ACC loop compute strong construct directives. These are more prescriptive approaches um, that that basically actually were adopted from the OpenMP standard and, and the philosophy towards uh, providing that functionality within OpenACC. So uh, uh, an important thing to note here 
is that uh, uh, the, AC, the ACC kernels uh, uh, approach that we did earlier, those uh, have automatic parallelization analysis in the compiler take place for, for each of those compute constructs. Whereas the, the parallel con uh, construct, uh, that essentially um, you know, it requires more di direction from the, from, from the program in order to achieve a, an effective uh, uh, parallel runtime and, and kernel to, to run on the GPU. Um, what, one interesting note is that ACC kernels, that, that can even encapsulate uh, multiple distinct sections of for loops. So you can have like, you know, for loop, for loop, like n for loops, and then you can have like another section of for loops, but you can like encapsulate both within the same two kernels, uh, within, within the same kernel, and it would basically uh, uh, devise uh, you know, one set of gains and workers and such to, to like work across both of those uh, kernel uh, um, for loops at once, and 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 sometimes the, the compiler would choose to do uh, uh, combine those two for loops and once in one if they if it's possible, or we'll end up creating two compute kernels within those uh, within that compute section. Whereas if you try to do that in in a in a parallel using the parallel directive, it can only Parallel directive can only define one compute kernel at a time. Each time you specify uh, an ACC parallel directive, it immediately creates a set of gains uh, um, uh, if, if there's no other uh, options specified to, to that section. Um, and thus then we'll, we'll perform pr uh, parallel performance at that level um, uh, unless you def de uh, define further specifications on that particular parallel region. Nonetheless, uh, ACC parallel does allow you to, to more tip more often achieve greater performance if you know what you're doing in terms of implementing that that particular uh, directive. So uh, uh, again, the ACC loop directive that that just is basically offering a descriptive for specific loops within a kernel or parallel uh, parallel kernel uh, within the ACC kernels directive or ACC parallel directive. Um, nonetheless, they, they can be combined. So you can see here you can just put ACC parallel loop. Or to do ACC parallel and then a second line of ACC loop and then specify options, uh, but nonetheless the loop option just basically tells tells the compiler that we, we're wanting to specify more details about a specific loop that we're we're uh, uh, describing against. So again, you, you, we can specify you know that, that we want a specific loop to be a gain type loop, a worker type loop, a vector type loop. Gains will be uh, distributed across SMs and each will have that shared memory cache. Uh, workers will be uh, um, basically. Uh, distributed within each SM. Uh, each worker is uh, is actually a warp. Um, if you're familiar with that warp concept within uh, uh, CUDA computing, um, basically warps are, are are limited to always be in, in a in a size of 32. Um, so it's it's always useful to when when thinking about warps is uh, is a uh, that that kind of like sizing requirement of the hardware in terms of how the, these work worker units are scheduled. So when we then use a vector, which is basically uh, uh, the length of threads are, that is uh, number of threads that be executed in a SMT style for each worker. You usually want that that length of threads uh, a vec for a vector to be of the length 128 or 32. Um, but in this case, you know we're, we're just specifying which loop type we're wanting for each say uh, for loop or do loop we're, we're specifying, and the compiler here will still choose a, a, a good sizing for you uh, of like say the number of gains or number of workers or number of vectors. But if you wanted to, um, as I did mention earlier, that the option to specify those manually, so you you can do that with the with instead the num gains or num workers or, or vector length clause, uh, clauses. But uh, uh, th this is usually a, a good enough approach. Um, the later on, if you say go, profiling your, your code, uh, experimenting and playing with the number of each of those can be useful and in, in an interesting iterative process to, to see how that affects performance and how you might be able to achieve greater performance given hopefully uh, being informed somewhat by your awareness of the hardware architecture itself and what would be ideal for the particular uh, hardware type you're targeting. Um, it, it's important to note uh, that if, if you do start specifying like the number of gains, number of workers, number of vectors, the, the performance results might differ in terms of what, what the optimal combination might be depending on the hardware you're running on. So if you're on a V100 versus an A100, it might be a different combination that, that ends up being most optimal. So uh, uh, really when you start doing that, that greater level of optimization, you, you are starting to target specific hardware and thus becomes less portable. So th that's just a thought to have there in terms of, in terms of the programming approach here. Then another important uh, clause to cover is the collapse clause. And this basically unrolls tightly nested N, N uh, loops into a one large loop and basically equally distributes all th uh, threads across all the different loops. So basically if you have like a, a, a for loop over i and another for loop over j, it basically you know equalizes all those uh, uh, threads across i and j in, in one larger loop 
uh, rather than two separate loops. Um, and basically it increases the block size of threads uh, and, and exposes more parallelism to the, to the compute kernel, which is in, in most general purpose GPU programming approaches tends to be the, the better option. Uh, the, the, the option maybe to, to use the more specific, uh, specified kind of like sub-level of like one level, one for loop is gang, another level is vector, is if say the sizing of like the, the innermost loop is appropriate for, for the warp size you're kind of limited to for the, the number of bytes you have to process for each computation. Um, so uh, uh, basically uh, the, that collapse loop it has, has a greater flexibility for, for providing performant code. Um, it is typically used uh, uh, really in all cases, but uh, you see it most often definitely whenever you have uh, 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 more level, more than three levels of parallelism that are beyond the typical uh, uh, GPU's typical three three levels of hierarchy that we have discussed here with the gangs, workers, and vectors. Um, other clauses are important are the reduction clause. You know, if you have to sum into a single scalar variable across all the threads, uh, th that's basically a database condition, but it's a database condition that, that is well known in terms of how we can overcome. And so there's a specific clause to, 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 to navigate that effectively for the compiler that helps synchronize data between threads uh, uh, without necessarily overriding data values as, as uh, some threads uh, go faster than other threads. Um, they, they don't synchronize effectively all the time. And so having this reduction clause um, helps manage that synchronization effectively so, so you still get correct answers when you have that sort of, that sort of type of operation. So th this would be a type of operation down here if you have like a sum here, you know, each thread is like writing into sum, but if each thread does that, then like, you know, without say considering, um, you know, other threads at the same time, you, you might be overriding a, another thread's calculation at the same time. So, so basically there has to be a, uh, it has to be made in an atomic operation and the reduction clause ha uh, helps you do that in an effective manner. Um, there's also the atomic clause itself. And that's more useful if you have like a, a scalar, a, a, a vector say of values that say is being uh, added into by a, a larger dimension vector uh, calculation on this side of the, of the equation. So uh, both of those have its applications, but th they're similar kind of like a pro processes that the compiler will, will use to, to, to navigate that for you. The last one is this parallel, uh, is this private class. Uh, private class basically specifies that each variable within an execution uh, compute kernel uh, should be private to each uh, of, of the threads and or, and or gain, depending on which, which level it's, it's basically specified under. And so uh, uh, basically, uh, that that's important to to help the the same in terms of like if you have a a a a temp variable say within a thread and it needs to be made private between threads so that it can do for, further calculations uh, um, within the 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 uh, that that particular compute unit. So some of these type of private variables tend to tend to kind of use the uh, uh, um, cache within say the uh, 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 SM that you might be running or, or the gain you might be running. So, so there might, might be opportunities there as well to consider like actually moving that variable into cache or, 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 or similar related variables. Um, it, whatever ha happens to, to work there, but that, that, that re requires some further tooling and investigation to, to see uh, which will work. And we, we could try to discuss that particular detail there because I uh, don't necessarily have time to, to cover that, that one at the moment. The last one I covered briefly is the ACC serial uh, construct directive. Um, you might be, re wonder why we would be interested in a serial directive when we're really interested in parallel programming. Um, and really the serial compute region, that, that just becomes useful whenever you're wanting to avoid data movement between the CPU and GPU. Um, so, the, the, you know, sometimes, you know, there might be the case just the, also the size of the loop is just not ideal for the high level parallelism achievable by GPU. So, so recall that, you know, we had around the order of like 200,000 threads that could be run at a single time a single clock cycle on a GPU. And if you have a small enough loop, it might be it might not be useful to run on a GPU, but nonetheless, you might still want it there just because there's just because there's a, a cost to move data between the GPU and CPU. So uh, um, in that case, you, you might still end up you know adding this ACC serial clause that basically tells the compiler to still run the section of code on the GPU, but it'll run it in a serial fashion rather than a parallel fashion. Um, so you, you can play around with that as well in terms of uh, seeing if that'll be effective for, for some approaches. But uh, unfortunately, at least in the many weather application, and it's actually a good sign, it, it's not applicable there. Um, th there's not really a good example for using ACC serial there, um, but you're, you're more than welcome to play around with it or, or, or see how it works in maybe your own uh, small uh, toy examples you might say pull out and work with as you learn more about OpenDCC computing. Um, so uh, now let's go forward with the, the uh, uh, ACC parallel prescriptive directive. And so uh, th this will be our next ex exercise we can go through. And we have about 
10 minutes left. Uh, so not a lot of time to, to go into too much detail in terms of all of these. But uh, basically what we can go through, we can go through each of those sections we did earlier and, uh, and convert those sections to the payload directive and look for ways in which using some of those clauses that we just covered uh, to, to specify better how to parallelize code within, within each of these uh, 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 compute kernels. So uh, you know, let's go back to our, our uh, source file here. We can go to, you know, to do to each of our uh, sections. Let's go to the first one here. So we, we have, um, we can set changes to parallel as we want to do. Uh, and now uh, let's see what, what we might want to add within this particular section that would be useful. So for here, it looks like uh, we have these th uh, three uh, nested loops. Um, so that might imply we would actually want to use this collapse class three here. And uh, I believe that's actually the most uh, effective uh, option we have here. I think the, the last consideration you might make would be say privatizing some of these variables, but um, actually for scalar variables, scalars are, are by default private. So you don't necessarily need to to specify that, like say this this disk computation, which is then reused later, uh, um, it, it should be reused. Yeah, it's reused here, um, is is in fact made private between threads. So uh, that that is in fact not needed. Um, so we, we can continue then to go forward with uh, the next to do section and kind of like you know step by step go through each of these uh, compute kernels, um, change out to the uh, parallel uh, uh, method and uh, uh, com a compute construct. And kind of do, do these kind of similar things. So, like in, in this case, uh, we see four nested loops. Um, th this one you might, looks like could be useful. Just put the the collapse four here. There might be some opportunities to, to uh, instead be a little bit more uh, pedantic in terms of which levels of of these four loops are in fact uh, maybe made. Uh, this is like a gang level parallelism or not? Because you know th this lack session here. This is actually a pretty small size problem. You know, these are just over the number of variables, which in this case is, is five, I believe, or four, um, and a central size, size, which is just three. So th there's not much like kind of work being done in this section. So, uh, but nonetheless, the, the collapse class will still at least allow to expose a lot of parallelism effectively. So there shouldn't be too much of an issue in terms of uh, um, doing, uh, uh, specifying it this way. Um, I don't see anyone, any others in this section, at least off the top of my head. Um, but nonetheless, uh, uh, making sure you want to give time for questions. But I I'm just going to like show what the type of performance you can expect uh, from, um, say, a well-executed uh, uh, um, runtime of the model uh, uh, using the, the OpenACC directives. So basically, you know, I, I had here originally the, the uh, example code you could use, um, which, which you would be been editing, but I just change it back to the, the test version. Um, and so we see when you run that, you know, we get back to you know a very short time of 0.53 seconds, where before uh, uh, we had that runtime of like uh, 16 seconds. So if if you do after using the kernels directives, that is. So if you if you do run the model uh, and and go through further editing and and uh, uh, testing the the types of uh, um, directives you can use, you can achieve pretty pretty substantial performance speed up using uh, uh, um, th this approach. Uh, so uh, Again, that's that's about it. That I guess we more or less have time for. I'll just let, let, leave the rest of time for any questions you might have. So we're about five minutes left, but uh, happy to still kind of like go through the uh, uh, remaining kernels and talk about them further if you like. Um, if if you would want to go through uh, uh, like the the solutions in a sense and and see what uh, you know have already been done, you you can open up this file here and scroll to each section and see what's what's been done. So I'm actually kind of curious in terms of the, uh, let's see, does it, I think it does have the to do that. Okay, yeah, we have to find, instead we have to find the ACC sections here. So I think I wanted to look at um, the last one we did, which was um, around line 280. Because I think there's some uh, specialized approaches they used. I want to double check if I'm talking about that one effectively. So uh, uh, this one, yeah, this one it did and it has it ended up privatizing and it also uses async, which we'll talk about later. Um, but uh, in terms of the the yeah, so so like the the stencil here does have to be privatized because this one is in fact a vector, um, but it's being operated on by a higher dimensional uh, vector in terms of inputting that that state into it. So uh, uh, that that is in fact a, an important one that you want to add in this particular case. And so that that's the type of op, uh, of like optimization you also want to be on the lookout for. Um, as well as then this vowels vector, the D3 vowels, 
uh, I believe this flux, I don't think the flux needs it either. Um, so the, the, those are uh, the types of um, optimizations you can like look for. And again, you can even like improve upon it further with uh, making these kernels run asynchronously. But uh, we'll talk about at the second half of, the, of this session um, uh, at the next workshop. But uh, um, I've been uh, talking a, a lot. So uh, feel free to ask any questions or if there's any concerns running the, the, the problem so far in the notebook, I'm happy to take your, take your uh, uh, questions. And uh, while you might be typing in the chat or if you want to raise your hand and ask live, um, I'm going to also open up uh, uh, basically what the output looks like if you were to open up the uh, uh, output NC files. And so if you want, you can run NC view like we have here and then uh, uh, navigate through. Uh, so in this case, we're just apparently the, the last test was one of the test cases. So if instead I'm going to look at a more interesting output file, let's, let's run the uh, um, Let's run the uh, uh, main program here, which I believe will have a 600 second runtime with output every 100 seconds. Um, so you see it, it ran pretty fast. Um, so not not too concerned there. So let's let's uh, you know try this again. I think that will give a more interesting output we can look at. Um, yeah. So so this one has uh, you, you can see this kind of results, and if you want, you can play with the resolution sizing and other things you can see different sort of impacts and how that uh, uh, you know uh, changes the 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 uh, 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 visualization you get for, for the particular problem we're running and if you uh, again if you want to go back and uh, change the types of problems that these are running you can uh, uh, the test case will always run the the, the thermal uh, problem um, but otherwise you can just go directly in the uh, source file itself and go up to the, the user configured parameter section and you can specify the data specs there. And that will basically what you, the options you have to choose from are within the, uh, 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 basically you know, within this section of the uh, um, mini weather app that you can read through. So you have like the uh, thermal, thermally at neutral, neutral atmosphere you can model, basically a mushroom cloud, you wanna look at that. Colliding thermals, uh, you can look at uh, mountain gravity waves, which is the one we just looked at, um, density currents, or, or uh, uh, injections, which was with that, that uh, picture example already showed earlier. Um, I'm not seeing the questions in the chat yet, so you know I'm happy to just kind of uh, you know talk a little bit further with the you know, last minute. But it, nonetheless, um, I appreciate everyone's time. Uh, any anything else from the group, or feel free to follow up in Slack as well. Well, um, nonetheless, uh, you know, basically you, at the end here, we just have some suggested resources for you to follow. Um, you, you can, Matt, Matt Norman does have a specific post on like practical introduction to GPU refactoring in Fortran with directors for basically climate scientists. So if you want interested in reading that, I encourage you to look through that uh, article there. Um, there's again, those uh, best practices guide and reference guides. And if you are interested in CUDA specifically, which is requires the in, more in-depth control of, of programming the GPU, there's a really good uh, training series that Oak Ridge National Lab offer that you can explore further, but that's like a nine part series, um, very extensive, but uh, obviously with, with the, the scope and probably time most programmers have and uh, scientific researchers, uh, OpenACC just allows that quicker access towards getting your program running on the GPU. So that's hence why we're focusing on there. But if you, if you are very interested in like, you know, the most optimal best performance CUDA, CUDA training that might be useful for you to explore. So I see a question from Matt Heyman. Is ACC sub, uh, serial typically nested within ACC kernel or ACC parallel? And in this case, no. Uh, so basically, the uh, const but all three of those uh, directives are considered uh, compute construct directives. And um, as I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about the the kernel directive, where did it go? Yep. Uh, all these compute construct regions, only one may be, may exist in a singular context. Uh, the, the serial con uh, construct uh, or directive is in fact creating a GPU kernel. It's just creating a GPU kernel with like one, one uh, gang, one worker and one vector, uh, 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 one, a vector of size of, of length one. Um, so if you tried to say put another parallel con construct within that or say uh, say a serial one within a parallel one, it's basically trying to create a new kernel that's like of a different sizing than that's already instantiated. So it, it would end up failing. And you know, if, you, if you want, you can try it and you, you can see the error that uh, the program will throw at you when it tries to make the file. But nonetheless, um, yeah, no, no, they, they can't be nested within each other. 
But uh, um, barring no further questions, I, I appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, uh, oh, okay. So, and uh, well, I see that William had uh, uh, said that he couldn't find the notebook. So um, nonetheless, we, we can share more details in the Slack as well as over email again in terms of uh, where the notebook is. But essentially, uh, it's in the NCAR GPU workshop uh, GitHub. So if you go to github.com um, slash NCAR uh, slash GPU underscore uh, workshop, there's then the folder of uh, that. Oh, I direct messages that my response there to the wrong person. Um, there is that folder that's basically section five, starts with zero five, that basically has the contents from this session. So you're more than welcome to go into that uh, repo there and um, pull it down either within on Glade when you're working on Casper, or if you'd like, you can try to navigate running it on your own system, especially if you have a, a GPU connected to your own laptop. Uh, a lot of these problems still work pretty effectively, even on a, a, a consumer grade uh, GPU. Um, so it might be interesting to you to explore uh, running these problems on that different class of GPU compared to the uh, higher performance ones that we have available on the HPC clusters. But uh, um, yeah, uh, feel, feel free nonetheless, you know, again, reach out to us over email or over Slack. Uh, we're happy to field the questions and uh, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to continue working on this, uh, uh, ex the exercises in this workbook on your own time um, as, as you might, might, might like or have interest. But uh, uh, thanks again for, for everyone's time today. I'll go ahead and stop the recording, but I'll keep the, um, I'll 